I'm just going to briefly summarize some main things from yesterday, remind you of some ingredients that we needed for the, to make a successfully uh, assemble various structures, and then I'll talk a little bit about self-replicating system, systems, and then if we end up having time about uh, uh, catalytic and adaptable systems. So, very briefly yesterday, what I showed you is that we definitely need specific interactions if you want to make some arbitrary objects that are not lattices. And in principle, the more species we have, the better the uh, success of the assembly. We also talked about how the lowest energy local minima are the most de mostly detrimental for the yield of, the, of these structures. And we talked a little bit about how we can optimize bond strength such that we improve the yield. Now, what I didn't stress, and this is very important, is that by using these specific uh, interactions, what we are basically doing, we are restricting assembly pathways uh, to the ones that we are very much interested in that lead us to the, to the, uh, to the desired uh, ground state. And we are doing that by really just designing interactions on a microscopic level between our building blocks. And so from yesterday, Basically, this is what we this is what we did. This is our uh, model system that we work on, and we were just basically using DNA uh, to code the particles following specific interaction rules, and then realize assembly of desired structure. And there was a, a cocktail of approaches that we used to do this. So I hope that was fun. I mean, for me, when I first saw that, um, that movie, it was like I was just a kid. I really wanted to build those things. It's, a, it's, really, it's really absolutely amazing. And you could also see from these building blocks that they were extremely complicated, right? There were so many levers and pulls. So it's, a, it's very interesting. I mean, they have series of papers on this where they sort of show their designs. But it just, for me, it's absolutely unbelievable how someone could think of all these things mechanically and, and make these things replicate and recombine and, and do all these kinds of things. And so, um, so I, I want to talk about replication and how we can implement replication with our DNA-coated colloids. And what I'm telling, going to tell you about is very much inspired by the movie that we saw, but also by the work of uh, John von Neumann, right? Uh, a famous uh, mathematician. Basically, he was very much interested also in what, are, what is the logic behind the process of self-replication, basically. He didn't care at all about the physical model systems and, and, and biology. He really just wanted to understand the logic. So what are the necessary ingredients for us to actually replicate something? And he was, in his mind, he was trying to build a, a universal machine that is capable of building any other machine universal robot, it can build any other robot, and then as a special case, build itself. And so we are going to be uh, driven by something like that. So we would like to replicate a, a structure, and uh, it is going to be a physical model system, but we are not going to worry very much about some details. But before I do that, I mean, since von Neumann onwards, there has been a lot of work, first computational, and then in recent years, experimental, on actually trying to realize repli uh, self-replicating systems. And one of the main obstacles is achieving exponential uh, growth, actually. And here are a few recent uh, examples. Uh, it started actually with, uh, with this paper for nine, from 97, where they had a, a self-replicating uh, peptide that, was, that man they managed to design a cycle that, that does this. Then it followed, but they didn't have really a, a exponential growth, and I, I must admit I forgot what was the reason. Then there was this paper where they used the RNA enzyme to, to achieve, uh, achieve self-replication. And here they have uh, basically achieved the self uh, exponential growth. Uh, but uh, it's, I mean, it's a fa fabulous system, but it's sort of, uh, in some sense, it's cheating because it's really utilizing the machinery that exists in biology, it's just that they took a specific piece of RNA strand to demonstrate it. Now, these things are all based on 
uh, DNA kind of uh, tiles, like the, like the one that we mentioned uh, yesterday. So here there are literally square tiles, but like square Lego pieces with protruding binding sites. The same case here and here. In, and in all of these schemes, the idea is that if they have some starting structure, here it's a linear strand, here you know, these are circular rings, and here they have just some uh, template here at the sides of the base. And in this case, they basically uh, allow the system to attach complementary pieces, but then to actually achieve the separation, they do it manually, okay? And then they repeat the process, so there is no exponential growth here. In this particular case, they also have this quasi one dimensional system where they basically just grow on the template itself. They grow copies of their, of their structure. And at some point they basically shake it and break it apart into pieces. And then this process, again, they break it apart uh, and so on. Uh, and then the last case, and this is the most promising recent, uh, recent one, where they actually could achieve uh, exponential growth of these rings, but the error rate is just huge, right? Basically, most of the copies that they get are just either partial copies or, or, or just uh, of, the, of the ring. But uh, so this is all just to show you that there is definitely work in that field and the, the steps are being, um, the progress is being made. Okay, so we want to do something similar just in, with our clusters. And I just come back to our small six uh, particle cluster of tahedron, just because we've been mentioning it uh, a lot and it's easy to explain things, I think. And so the idea is the following. So we are going to basically mimic what we've seen so far in the sense that we are start from a cluster, we are going to immerse in a sea of particles, so basically food. The, these particles are going to attach to the surface of our cluster, and they're going to follow some rules, and I'll explain them. Once they are attached, they're going to combine and make bonds between themselves, and then at some point they're going to detach from the parent cluster, and whatever is detached, it's going to form the original the copy of the desired structure. And you can see here that there are two structures here, an octahedron and a dimer, and hopefully very soon it will be clear why you need both. Okay, so I don't know how much can be seen. Hopefully you can see. So this is just animation of the octahedron being immersed, and we are just looking at the geometry at the moment, not the interactions. Just octahedron being immersed in a sea of particles, and so each particle in the octahedron attaches one uh, particle from the solution. These particles can then move around and make bonds make between them, like in this particular case. So here, what you have is four on one side and then two on the other. Since you have four on one side, it's very hard to bring these, the remaining two, which are geometrically constrained. So we need somehow extra two particles to be able to have six green guys. And this is what the second parent is for, so this dimer. It brings two extra particles into the story. And so these then attached particles form bonds. And at some point, we have something that we call melting, which I will explain in a bit. And what we are left with is basically a copy of the octahedron. And then we also have a, a copy of the second pairing, which is a dimer. So that's the, basically the, the geometry behind the process. Now, the real process actually looks like this. So now this is the, the full and the interaction matrix that we, that we use to do this. And um, because if you remember, we had these, uh, we have these um, particles that are supported with DNA, and so if two come together, they have to have complementary DNA strands on them. So in that sense, when this uh, starting parent pair is involved in, a, in, 
production of, uh, of their copies of their progeny, they're actually making a structure that has complementary DNA strands on them. And only then in the second cycle is the original uh, pair being formed. So it's uh, what is known as a hypercycle. Okay. And so this is the, the matrix. You can see now that there, I'm actually showing two colors. So it's not anymore just white and blue like we had so far. And the reason is that now actually we had to do some bond strength optimization. So it was not straightforward to just we actually had to, pre, to influence kinetically some states versus the other. And we also need these ingredients. First is particle species valence, very important, because we need to control how many different particles attach to the surface of the parent, right? So we need that to be one per parent, okay? And so this is a very important thing. And the second thing is the, the, the fake separation, or well, actually the, the not, something that's not really biological, as Olivier would say. So we are completely faking, doing a fake process here, but it's the one that we found that, uh, that works. But we can discuss about that at the, at the end, maybe. But so the way, so we have to somehow separate um, children from their parents, right? And what you saw in the Penrose movies, he had this sequence of levers that were one triggering the other and was achieving this, right? So we don't, well, at least we don't know yet how to implement it with the, with the DNA, DNA things. But the one thing that we can do is we can design these strands to have some typical lifetime. Okay? And then by designing the lifetime, we can impact we can sort of design the separation of the, of the children from the parents. Okay. And so I said several things. So the first one I will just briefly mention. I said, I showed that this is a, a hypercycle. So a, strand is a set is making a complementary, complementary set. And this is sort of a reminiscent of the work that uh, so Eigen did with Schuster back in the 80s, so they were trying to argue for this uh, RNA uh, kind of origin of, of life. And with the RNAs, right, the, what they were suggesting as a, as a cycle is that actually, the, because there are, you know, the plus and minus strands of RNA, that the minus strand is catalyzing formation of the plus and then the plus of the minus, and therefore you have this hypercyclic behavior, and so this is how the one of the necessary ingredients for the origin of life. So this is just uh, uh, a side note, I won't go into there, but it, as it turns out, just because we are using these strands and complementary strands, we are ending up with this uh, uh, hypercycle kind of structure. Okay, so I will show you simulations now, and then I will uh, spend some time trying to argue how we can actually do this in experiments, because this is a more, uh, a more important so we use this, the same simulations we used for, for our uh, clusters from before that I showed yesterday. And so here, basically, we are starting with the two parents. You don't see anything, because otherwise you won't be able to see anything. There are like millions of little solvent particles, plus there are hundreds of different colloidal particles. So we don't show any of those unless they're attached to the surface of our parents, okay? And so these are these vague, grayish things, they look better on my screen, unfortunately, but hopefully you will see them. And uh, so I will run simulation now. Hopefully it works. Yeah, so it, uh, so it basically very quickly starts. So I, I sped up the simulation basically so that it starts, I think, some, some somewhere here. But, uh, so basically, I hope what you can see are two types of clusters, two colors of clusters, one that is red, green, blue, and the other one, pink, yellow, light blue. And then there are also lots of these dimer structures, which are the second pair. And basically, the summary of these simulations is shown here. So this is just a log linear plot of the number of clusters. We didn't distinguish here uh, the color, just the number of clusters as a function 
of time and we sort of have this uh, exponential kind of growth. Fortunately, my computer is not allowing me to speed up anything. It just switches to another um, screen. So I don't know what is the best thing to do. Well, you can imagine that it just progresses until, until basically there is no more food left. So these are all canonical uh, ensemble simulations. So we just put in some number of colloids and then the simulation stops when there are no more uh, thing, there are no more free particles around. So, what I told you is that we need extra ingredients, okay? And so one is this species valence, so we need to be able to control this. And yesterday I briefly mentioned this beautiful experiment that is done with the emulsion droplets, but now they can actually do it also nicely with colloids. And the idea is that you can put this DNA in the emulsion droplets in such a way that they are actually mobile. Okay? With the colloids, you have to coat the colloids first with a, with a, lip, with a lipid bilayer, and then DNA can move on the surface of that layer. But the, the principle is the same. You can control the density of the DNA on the particles. And by just, if you know, you can measure how much, how many bonds roughly you need to actually achieve, how many strands you need to achieve one bond. And then by controlling the number of bonds, you can control the valence uh, of these, uh, of these particles. And it's, the, the, it's definitely working in both the, the emulsion case and the colloidal case. We don't have yet perfect control over the valence. There are still some obstacles, but uh, it's uh, definitely getting there. So in, that ingredient is uh, almost there. The second ingredient is a little bit more tricky. And these are these time-dependent interactions. So basically what we need so we don't want particles in our solution to just spontaneously form aggregates, okay? We want the parents that we put in to control what happens. So we want somehow to, to this, for these particles in the solution to take a very long time until they actually reach their full bond strength. So if the two come together, given the temperature of the experiment, they will just basically fall apart. But then, we want them to very easily bind to our parent clusters and then live there for some time and then separate. Okay? And just be lo there long enough that the, the bonds between these attached particles for them to form and be stable at the given temperature. So that's the idea behind, the, behind these time-dependent interactions. And the thing is that the, this part here is already realized in experiments, again, with DNA. So these are DNA nanoparticles that are being coated, and they can control uh, the, how long it takes for the, for the bonds to, to form a full strength. They can control it on a wire, wide range of scales. So this works uh, very well, but this is, the, this is the tricky part. But then the hope is, that by using so-called strand displacement reactions, uh, one should be able to do this. And if you haven't seen this be before, I, this is why I put this uh, image here. It's an incredibly cool, cool thing. This is done by my colleague Ben, uh, colleague ben Rogers when he was at Harvard with Vinnie Manahar. And basically by designing how these DNA strands bind and, the, and putting some small strands floating in a solution, they can basically make a system where at low temperatures and high temperatures, you have a fluid, and then at the intermediate temperatures, you have a solid. Okay, so they can code these particles, and then in such a, and they can also do the reverse. So in such a way that at very low temperatures, the system is fluid. At very high temperatures, the system is fluid, so the particles don't bind. But then there's some intermediate range where they just form solids. Okay, so they can really influence the phase diagram. So this is not something you typically see, right, with the regular method. Very different. They can also do the reverse. They can make a solid at low temperature and a solid at high temperature. 
and then just squeeze in between with the same particle just by designing this DNA structure. So I somehow in my head daydreamed that this is going to be used to, to solve this problem. Alternatively, there is some nice work done at uh, ESPCI, but by our colleague, Yannick Ronzele, and they basically use these enzymes, niches, to separate things one from another. So the one idea would be to just have some concentration of these niches floating around, and then when the bonds are formed, the niches can attack them and separate them. So there is some, of course, it's not as easy as I'm describing, but there is some, there are some ideas behind the insimilar. So it's not realized yet, but the ingredients are, are being built there in the experiments. So maybe, well, at least in my head, I daydream that sometime, sometime in the future they will be able to do this. Unless we, of course, figure out an easier way to do, to actually separate things one from another. In uh, some experiments they, that done with these tiles that I showed at the beginning, they use a um, cycle of light like day and night, like temperature and, and light. And this is how they, they oscillate and cycle things. And this is the way to separate structures. But you cannot go beyond a dimer. So that's the largest thing you can actually do in this way and without creating problems. Okay. So that was a, a, a three-dimensional system. Now, the, although the simulations that we've done are really fast and then you can do things, um, it's still, you're very limited to the maximum number of, of you know, particles that you can observe. So at some point we actually switched to a two-dimensional system. And this is a work done by a student, Hibunori Tanaki, who just finished his uh, PhD uh, two weeks ago. And uh, so the idea is to switch to two-dimensional system and look at the replication of just squares, okay? And the design was the following. So the two parents are the two squares that, uh, on which particles can attach. Once they're attached, they can also attach between themselves and form bonds. And then at some point, again, using the same melting idea, so the, the time-dependent interactions, these things separate and then form into copies of, of these squares. And then the, the two uh, copies of the square, complementary squares, make the original one. And so this is the interaction matrix for the system and the numbers here just correspond to the valence, the species valence we need for it. Of course, this is what, what, we, what we would like to do. But even when we set up the system, we have to look at what are actually all the pos possible things that, that can happen, okay? And so this branch here is just the replication of the squares. But here, actually, because it can happen that you end up having five, uh, a chain of five being uh, catalyzed, okay? And then, it, then itself we cannot close, and then it just catalyzes formation of another five more chains. Or you can end up having three parents being involved in production of one child, in which case you end up with these six rings that can then replicate more copies of the six rings. So these are the dominant pathways. There are other ones, but these are dominantly uh, what we expected to see. I hope the simulation works. No, come on. Want to work here? We just started with uh, a few squares in, in a bath of particles. Now the, you don't see this color coding because otherwise it's nothing is visible. So what you see is just two colors, red and blue. Red means it's a, an activated parent, meaning that it has some particles attached on it, so it, it is ready for, for uh, replication. It can participate in the replication process. And blue means it's not an active parent. It doesn't have things attached to it, or it maybe has one particle attached to it. So, but it's not really a can good candidate for a replication process. And so this was, this was the, the starting point, and we just ran the simulation. And of course, you can see here that it's a much bigger simulation than what we had in three-dimensional case. 
although you didn't see all the particles, these are usually usually bigger. Yes, exactly, because this can happen. So instead of just a square being copied between two parents, you can actually have just geometrically, it's possible to add yet another particle, not four, but five, and to, to bind them between the two parents and then separate. And then it's a line because the green and the green don't like each other, so they cannot form a, a loop. They end up just forming a line that can then copy itself. And so what you end up is something that we've seen sort of in, um, in Claudia's talk at the, uh, the, beginning, the last, beginning of the last week. So you have a bunch of blue inactive things in the center and then you have red things at the, uh, at the boundary, okay? And Yeah, we need them to, to be able to separate. We need to give them some time. Of course, there are different ways to be realized it in simulations, but we tried the variety of things and the bottom line is we just need to separate them at some point. We just give them some time scale and then it separates. Not very elegant. True biology does it. Lots of different ways and better, but it is what it is. Okay, so basically these are just a few snapshots from one of the simulations. That we've, that we've done, and so we, this is just at some point in time, and basically you can see how the colony expands and grows, but the growth is really happening at the surface the, of the colony. And really what I'm writing here is, is what, what Vijay was, <laughs> was basically showing in, in both of his talks, so just a, a reaction diffusion equation, um, and uh, the thing is that we can show that the radius of the, I mean, so the solution is just a, a, a traveling wave, and we can show that the radius of colony is basically growing linearly with, uh, with, some, with the constant speed uh, that, we can, that we can calculate. And uh, it's also an interesting, interesting thing, of course, in the, the Fisher type equations, the width of the traveling front is, uh, front is basically uh, given by the diffusion constant. And so if the, I just said, want to write this. Um, okay, so you have two cases. And then, so if this length scale is much bigger than your system size, basically what you see, what you would expect to see is just an exponential growth. But then if it's, uh, if it's uh, smaller, then you end up seeing a uh, growth that is proportional to uh, time over to the power of d, where d is just the dimension of the system. So d to the d. And then this is basically what you observe also in our case. So this is just a, a t square. There, it's not, we didn't fit, it's just a, a t square uh, line. And so this is what we, what we observe. So it's, it's a nice system because it's uh, two-dimensional, so it's easier to do a calculation in a, in a bigger system. But One question. Also be played. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, in this simulation, you require a parent, right, to yes. start with. Yes. And then go. Exactly. So we, we imagine that these guys, on the, that they need to be exposed to each other for a very long time until they reach the full bond strength. Okay, so given the temperature of the experiment, they're just never exposed to themselves, to each other long enough, unless they're bound to a parent. They can easily bind to a parent. And so once they're in the parent, the, the collision frequency just increases dramatically, right? So they're localized in space, and they can actually form bonds. Okay? But this was the, the, the fun part. This was the only thing that we did in terms of Introducing some mutations, whatever the mutations mean in our case. But basically, what we changed a little bit the interaction matrix. So we started from a colony at some point, and then we mutated one of the structures. So the melting time scale was changed, it's a bit different. And then 
the, the thing is the following. So these are just the two scenarios that we expect to see, of course, and this is what we saw, is it, the mutation either uh, doesn't survive as the colony grows it, or it actually survives and then starts spreading in this um, sector kind of a, a way. But we didn't, uh, we didn't do much analysis on this. This was just, um, just uh, try to see if we can realize this easily in two dimensional this, because in three dimensional these simulations do take much longer, you need much more generation to actually see this happen. Okay, so this was about the replication and I don't have much more time. One more, one more question, yep. uh, just to mark it. Have you looked at the density fluctuations? Uh, the Poissonian? Uh, no, okay. Time to do something else. No, no, it's a, uh, this is the, this is the one thing is nice about you know, spending time at, at Harvard. I have great students, but uh, they're interested in doing variety of things, but they are very easily excited about things and excited about working with, with variety of people. And when they belong to a school like, like uh, Hidenori did, who is the C's, then, oh, this guy is doing something more interesting now. Now I want to work with him and then, you know, it's sort of they diffuse around like these little guys and just work with the different roles. So, yeah, so he, he left. We didn't pick up anyone else to, to do that, but it's there. And it's easily to pick it up. And I, I think it's a nice model system that lots of interesting questions can, can be asked. And it's an easy simulation. This is the whole point. Very, very easy. Okay. So I'll spend a little, uh, the rest of the time. I don't know how much, I don't think I have much more time because we stopped that watch when the, general movie just came. Okay, a little bit more time. So what I showed you is how we can, our way of replicating. Okay, so we were doing, first of all, an autocatalysis, right? But so now I want to, to talk about how we can make like a general catalytic system. And this is very much inspired by the works of Alexander Oferin and Freeman Dyson, and there are other ones there as well, but these are the biggest protagonists of metabolism first uh, hypothesis, or um, basically saying that the, the life, and we had a discussion in one of the groups about this, that the life started um, as uh, the emergence of catalysts catalyzing other catalysts, and then only uh, RNA kind of uh, molecules appeared, uh, so later in the, in the evolution. But anyway, so their work inspired very much what I'll tell you about. And so when I think about the uh, metabolism, so this is basically the first thing usually that pops to my mind. It's the calorie cycle. You have molecules that use energy molecules to create other molecules, to help uh, catalyze formation of other molecules. Of course, it's not as simple as I'm saying, but essentially this is what is, what is happening. So, when I daydream about things, you know, it would be very interesting if you would have a system where, you know, you, we start from one structure and then that one catalyzes formation of many other ones that we program. And all of a sudden you have a factory of parts that can, can come together and form something bigger and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a nice thing to, for me at least, to daydream about. And so this is what we are going to try to do. And again, I'm going to use this octahedron, but it's really the simplest one to show all these things on, although we can do it in other things. But uh, the question basically that we ask is, so if we start from a structure like this, it's clearly a you know, seven particle cluster that has some interaction uh, matrix that I will show in a bit. So can we somehow can catalyze formation of a structure like this, right? And we are going to use these template-based ideas that we used also for the replication. But uh, this is basically the idea. We start from a parent catalyst, we immerse it in a sea of particles that follow some interaction rules. These particles can attach at the surface of 
are catalysts. Once they are attached, they can form bonds. At some point, detach. Again, we are doing this melt take melting and, and uh, time dependent interactions, but they have to detach somehow. And then what we are left with should fold into a structure that uh, we desire. So this is what we want to do. And the question is, can we design interactions to do this? And so, uh, this is basically the interaction matrix that designs this structure, this catalyst. And this here is the adjacency matrix for this octahedron structure. So adjacency is just saying who, which particle is in contact with this, okay? And so you can already, of course, I'm showing you an example where this is visible, but you can already see some elements of this matrix in, in this one here. So basically, if we take species two, three, four, and five, we can basically create particles A and B. But then we somehow need two copies of particle species seven, and then the remaining, the, the matrix that we end up with is the one that we are after. This basically means that instead of just one particle per parent particle being attached from the solution, with the particle number seven, we need a valence of two, right? So we need two from the solution uh, to be actually able to do this. Okay. So back to this image, and I sort of skipped over it, but now I can point out. So here what you can see is that there are two particles attached to the gray one. So two dark gray guys attached. And then once the structure separates, you end up having uh, our octahedron, okay? And so this is the full interaction matrix. And just in this case, the orange uh, square means it's a valence of two, not a valence of one for these uh, attached particles. Okay, so, oh, come on. And so this is a simulation, the same type of simulation we used so far. It's a huge box. There, and there are like a thousand particles here. You don't see them unless they're attached to the surface of the, of the catalyst. And once they're attached, they follow interaction rule like here. And at some point, they separate. And what you end up with are very quickly moving of the hydra. But So this is the summary, basically, of the simulation. This is the number of clusters and function of time. And you can see that we are sort of producing these... Uh, of the hydra. So we have a structure catalyzing formation of, of completely different structures. Okay. But this is really not the only thing that we, if we, what I showed you, the simulation that showed you was very, very constrained. When, I, when we found the full simulation, meaning it follows the full interaction matrix that you saw, this is basically what we end up seeing. So we started from our structure, from our seven particle structure. It created octahedra, but it also created all kinds of other structures. So these guys are mostly, so this is a seven particle cluster, so these guys are mostly seven and eight. And these guys can then follow the same interaction rules, they catalyze formation of other guys. So we have one structure here that has nine, and then these guys further catalyze formation of other guys. So we have basically a catalyst for uh, create, uh, catalyzing formation of other catalysts, okay? And so the orange background means we are really getting the rigid clusters from our database, from the, the third the one that we use all the time. Uh, blue means we are ending up with local minima. And then without the color, we are just get this is just like junk. It doesn't do anything. But basically what we realized is that we have to go back to our our system to our matrix and our huge database of clusters and then really ask a question what are all the possible rigid structures that we can make using this matrix if we allow multiple copies of the gray particle because this was our extra rule okay once you do that we end up 
enumerating what are all the things that can happen, and it, it turns out that we can have, with these rules, we can have, as a result, 100 different geometries, uh, basically 176 different clusters. Uh, the maximum size is 11, and it cannot go beyond that. It only forms uh, junk if it goes beyond that. And we could also look at these catalytic cycles which we see emerge. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't point out that in the previous one. Uh, but actually, let me see. Ah, yes, okay. So here we started with our original catalyst, the catalyzed formation of something that was a local mineral, and it was not even a ground state, but that one catalyzed formation of a chiral pair of these guys. So it's the same structure, just a color, chiral image. And this is a small simulation. We've done, we've done larger ones, and we can see more cycles being formed. And because we have these results, we can also, apart from the simulation, we can just enumerate all the different cycles that can be formed of different of different sizes, we can find what's the maximum size, etc. And we can sort of also, because we know this, we can do a bit of calculations and look at the, just the matrix of transition probabilities and solve this eigenvalue problem and, and look at basically the, the mode with the largest eigenvalue the fastest growing mode in, in this case, so to this metabolic kind of behavior. And so this is just a, an example uh, of the mode that we get. So the size of the, of the cluster corresponds to the, to the concentration that we end up getting. And, so, and the lines are just an example of, a, of the a cycle that we can end up uh, getting. And of course, by <laughs> chain influencing this uh, time dependence, so the association time, we can influence the size of the cluster that we see uh, in the final uh, winning uh, metabolic mode. Here they are just arranged on a grid because I don't know how else to arrange them, but the lines are an example of a cycle that can form between these guys that are in the, in the metabolic uh, cycle. That but again, this is calculation that we didn't do this in, uh, in simulations. This requires much bigger simulations. But what we can do is the following, right? We can go back to our database of clusters, our database of interaction matrices, because we have all this. And we can ask these questions, what kind of uh, systems, catalytic systems, we can actually get with all the designs that, uh, that we have available. So this is a, res this is a result. We just look, I'm just plotting a, a maximum, this is the histogram of the maximum cycle size possible. And the, there are two different colors, they're just systems where we allow for valence of two on any of the, on, of the uh, building blocks, or a valence of one, okay, which is the gray, uh, gray result. And so if you have a valence of one only, like we had in the replication case, right, you just, the system cannot grow. There is no way to grow. You're you sort of limited. You just end up getting maximally the size of the of the pair. But if we allow for this valence of two, all of a sudden we have this huge uh, array of possibilities of what can happen. And the interesting thing is, we just uh, uh, maximum sacrifice over like we have here, but as a function of the number of geometries. Now different symbols are different interaction matrices, because I said we have this huge database of matrices and solutions. And this is the interesting thing. There are lots of solutions that you can have with just a few types of building blocks. So you don't need a lot of building blocks to actually have this emergent catalytic uh, uh, behavior. So the one that we used has seven, so it's this guy here. But there are lots of solutions with just the three or four it will still give you plenty of different geometries, so big enough met metabolism, and, uh, and uh, still have also decent cycle sizes. So it, uh, it doesn't take a lot of species to actually achieve this. And this was, this was surprising for us, because all the theoretical, um, some calculations that we done, I don't know, things that the Dyson done, uh, he had some limit 
what is the minimum number of different species you need to actually to get this uh, catalyst forming catalyst. But it turns out we, at least in our model, we don't need that many. And uh, and this was a uh, well, we were we were and we are still excited excited about by this. And what we are currently doing on this team is looking into these uh, small number of species, of systems, uh, catalytic systems with small number of species, because the experimentalists who are doing these things with DNA tiles, they can actually do, they, can, they have a way of doing these melting experiments, They're just interested in us giving them a matrix which is small enough that they can actually design these interactions uh, in a reliable way. So we are looking at some that are three and four and um, trying to think about a two-dimensional geometry where we can actually try to explore some of these things. Okay. And then this leads me to the last thing that I want to mention. And um, this is basically um, just a question. So can we make a system adapt? Can we make an adaptation uh, of, a, of a system? So, okay, yeah, sorry. So this is basically what I showed you before. So this was the, the design of the interactions that we used to create the catalytic system, but it really, the original question that we asked was how can we catalyze formation of just of this octahedron? And the first, the simulation that I showed you, right, the one that was just producing octahedra, I told you that we did some restrictions on it, and this is why you were only seeing octahedra. And this is basically the restriction that we did. So we didn't allow some of the elements in this matrix. Okay? And then if you just take these elements in the matrix, and none of the, none of the other ones, what we get is always an octahedron. We don't get other things. But now, the question that you can ask, okay, so okay, so you have a system where you can cat one can catalyze formation of another, so it's just one system makes one, uh, another one, but can we make the system make two different structures in a controlled, in a controlled way? And this is, the, this is the answer, so we can make the, uh, our catalyst form a different six particle structure, so remember this was an octahedron, this was a polytetrahedron, so the two six particle structures that, uh, that we have with, with, with identical particles. But to make this one, we don't need these elements, but we need an extra element here. So we started playing a little bit with basically elements in this matrix and what, can, what we can do with them. And so the idea is, okay, we start with a matrix like this, which just forms octahedra, but then we imagine adding some DNA strands or you know, shining a light, something that changes our interaction, mutates our interaction, and leads us to, these, to this uh, matrix. And then the idea would be that now we switch from making octahedra to making these polytetrahedra, but also the, actually if we do this, the octahedra that we made should flip into these other structures. Hopefully this works. Yeah, same type of a simulation, but here I am just showing you a few snapshots. Because it's very hard to see things. So we started from our catalyst that was producing very reliably our octahedra. At some point we flipped the switch, so we imagine just sprinkling some DNA strands there. These DNA strands are designed to basically break apart uh, bonds in the, in the octahedra, but also influence the catalyst itself. And so when that happens, all the octahedra basically break a bond and start forming a bond between the gray particles. Okay. So the octahedra switch to a different structure, but also the, our original catalyst, this guy continues just making these other structures. So it doesn't go back to making octahedra. So we have a system where we can switch to what gets produced. And then, of course, the natural question that then follows is, can we make our system still make octahedra even if we flip a switch? So 
So before the speech, we have this situation, and then after the speech, we have this one. But we, ha we want this to be somehow unstable. We want ha somehow to suppress formation of, of polytetrahedra and just make our desired guy. And of course, solution for that is you have to add something negative in all these, all these loops that we are, we are making. And one solution that we found, very simple one, is to basically allow our structure to make yet another structure that will then suppress formation of the, of the unwanted one. And you've seen these kinds of loops put in Sandeep's talk and Sunil's talk and then many other talks, they had this kind of negative uh, behavior. Okay, so this is the design of the matrix now. And so we are again, we are just playing with the same matrix, manipulating with the elements in the matrix. And the idea is that we start from a catalyst, which is immersed in a sea of, of uh, particles. Particles can bind, but now you can see also that in the back here, a dimer can bind. And so the thing that separates from the structure is something that folds into polytetrahedron, but we also have separation of a dimer that then impacts our polytetrahedron and leads to formation of the octet. And I will just show, I won't, I don't think I have a, I, have, I don't think I have a real simulation of, of this. I, I'll just to show you some snapshots. But it, I, what, I, what I want to say is, okay, so this looks completely okay. So now you, you need some new types of interactions, like what the hell now? But the thing is that uh, there is a very nice work done in the Andrew Ellington's lab. There are other labs as well, where they coat these particles, not just by, with DNA strands, but they also put hairpins, okay? And then what happens is that, what I imagine can maybe be implemented is that when these, uh, when these dimers come to our polytetrahedron, the one that we don't like, they basically initiate a chain reaction of these um, hairpins being opened up and blocked. And basically what happens ultimately is that the, the type of your particle, the type of interactions that are available on your particle basically change. And it's simply done just by triggering this chain event of hairpins being open. So it's not completely unimaginable um, doing in experiments. Okay, and so this is the final matrix. And these are just snapshots from the simulation. So we started with a system that made uh, octahedra, but then we had that switch that then made us octahedra flip to polytetrahedra, but also production of the dimers. And the idea is dimers basically attach to our polytetrahedra and pick the problem. So here is the number of octahedron clusters, but then after the switch, and then I just shifted the graph so that it can be seen after. getting the octahedra, just in a slower, slower way. And uh, a fun part is also that if I give you the system after a while, it also has actually a memory that something happened, right? Although there was lots of octahedra, you will have these dimer guys that tell you that there was an event impacted, right? So you can sort of trace uh, what had happened. And so with that, I will finish. Um, and so we talked basically about this template-based catalysis and autocatalysis. And the new ingredients that we needed were these particle valence control and time-dependent reactions. And the thing that was surprising for us in these catalytic cycles is that only a few particle types were enough for the emergence of these uh, cycles. And of course, I mean, what I showed you this, what I called an adaptation it's just some first attempts and thoughts that we have on this, but it's basically a, we are playing on the available elements in the matrix and see what can happen. And the solution that I just showed you, just one that you know immediately it will work because we understand these geometries very, very well. 
But basically, if you want to make something adapt, right, you need to implement some sort of a feedback loops that, uh, that allow us to have these uh, more complex functions. And uh, of course, I need to <laughs> recite all of my collaborators and people spent a lot of time talking to that influenced uh, a lot of this uh, in these people. So thank you for your attention. Uh, in the self-replicating part of the 2D, uh, the population was evolving, uh, it was increasing, and there was uh, traveling waves, right? Yeah. So the velocity of the traveling waves, it is constant or it is dependent upon um, the curvature of the wave? No. Well, I mean, we look, we didn't explore much, but what in the simulation that we had, which is just constant, uh, constant velocity. Yes. Um, um, I was thinking about this uh, assumption of time-dependent uh, yeah. interaction that maybe in biology it's very difficult to reproduce, but I was also thinking about this movie, and in the movie, the interaction are state-dependent. When you, two, uh, two of these uh, wood-made uh, toys are assembled, then you see that it changes, uh, etc. And it, it reminds me that maybe you know the theory of uh, eat and run, that instead of having, because all these uh, in, in molecular systems, all these uh, bonds are very, very fast, and it's difficult to explain long, uh, long reaction. And in the eat and run theory, is that when there is an interaction, for example, in your system, the um, the state of the molecule will change, and is everything is is like you change the color of your uh, of your, and then like this you can mate and change etc. So. Yeah, no, no. I mean, look, in the original, in the, the very first simulation that we did, this is exactly what, what we assumed. We assumed that we have this change of type. But the thing is that, that uh, at that time, it was the experiments that I showed were Andrew Ellington, others, they still, they still don't really exist. The change of a particle type of, by using these uh, hairpins, although there was an idea, there was, there was nothing there. Whereas the, the things with the time dependence were, were, were already out there. So we just, Putting that, but the very first simulations were exactly done like that. Just change the time. I have two very different questions. One has to do with the list of pioneers that you gave at the beginning. Yeah, probably missing Be a lot more. No, I just wondered uh, because, uh, in the sense, whether they have influenced thinking today. One was Conway, who developed a thing called the Game of Life. Yeah, so I was thinking about adding Conway because we had a discussion about Conway several times in, in our discussion, in discussion uh, group. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with Conway's Game of Life, so he, he, okay. he did this well, definitely. So he has been an influence in the field? Oh, I, mean, I, I think definitely yes, because it's a simple system where you can see all these. Uh, and you get morphogenesis as well there, in addition to replication. And the other person was Ganti, who built this thing called the Chemoton. Okay. And I understand built meaning, uh, designed. I understand someone has built it. This is what I heard two or three years ago. Okay. Definitely. I don't know whether anyone can comment on this. Uh, Andrash, would you know anything? Ganti's. Oh. <laughs> that, that's why I ask you, yeah. But it was explicitly based on metabolism. Sorry? Yeah. It was explicitly based on metabolism and uh, gave rise to self-replication through that. In his, his model, it was called Chemoton model, he, he, uh, he designed several subsystems and one of them was a, a metabolic subsystem. Uh -huh. And then was a membrane system and then was a, a kind of polymer which was supposed to be a coding system. So I think that his, uh, his model, it, it was very interesting but uh, it was much more complex than what you do, and mm -hmm. and I, I, well, I am not really expert, so I don't know how to compare them. Yeah, of course, no, no, I, I, I had known. I, I wrote down the names well, definitely. No, I just wondered in terms of its influence on your. So for me, I, I was not aware of that. If, but if, if I encountered it, it hadn't, it hadn't. Found it. Okay, now a question about your talk, if yeah. I may, which is in this business of designing adaptation, uh, seems to me there might be one uh, route. Perhaps you've already explored it, which is the kind of abzyme technique mm -hmm. 
have an intermediate transition state which takes you from wherever you're beginning to the desired end state and get that stabilized mm -hmm. by one of your uh, small things. Yeah, no, we haven't explored it, but yeah, that's, that's also a, a possible solution. We, we, just, we just started playing, playing with that, and there are many, many options. And the, the thing is to, to be able to explore all these options, what is missing, and, and hopefully I will get a PhD student soon, so this, uh, this happens. We need to understand first what are all the transitions and metastable things that we can actually make between these different, different desired structures, and then once we have that, then we can start asking questions: what is possible with a given interaction? So it's because many of these things we're just doing en masse on all these on all these data. So that's why I'm, I'm missing I'm missing that. The solution that I showed you is just the one that I can see with my eyes working. Just because I, I, I know these transitions in my head, right? Otherwise, it requires more. But yes, definitely. Any more questions? In case of DNA replication, not only speed but accuracy matters. So, would you like to comment how these two things are coming into your model? Yeah. So in the, in the case of, of, um, of the 3D replication, we definitely have errors. Okay? And, but we can, just from the geometry and, and what are the things that can actually happen, we can estimate what is the, geometrically, what would the error rate would be. And this is what we actually end up observing in the, in the simulations as well. I, didn't, I was not able to push them towards the end. If I did, I, I would have shown you that, uh, like an error state. And then, of course, the error state is one of the local minima that we had in our energy landscapes from, from yesterday, right? So it's, it's one of these guys. In the two-dimensional case, um, in some sense, although we wanted to design, right, we wanted to replicate squares, right? But we ended up having these uh, five mirrors and six mirrors. So you can think about those as being errors that we don't like, but you can also think about them as, as possible, uh, possible states. But there, there was no, you either end up getting one of those or, or nothing else. So there was, there, was no, there was no other error. So you can either think about them as errors or, or as, as states that you end up, end up having. But we didn't have any other kind of error. They were just, it's too small and just it's a very simple. Just, just two species also that matter a lot. It's very hard to make errors. into picture somewhere. Yeah, so the, of course, the, I, I didn't show any, any of that. So the, the volume fraction, so what is the density of the food and how things are actually moving around and diffusing, it, it, it influences what you, what you end up seeing and whether or not you're in this regime where you see the exponential growth or, or actually the C to the B, etc. So they, they all influence. But yeah, I, we can talk about it, but I didn't have time to talk. Any more questions? So let's once again thank the speaker. Thanks a lot for making it very interesting.